He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. I love that um, arrangement of may the mind of Christ uh, dwell in me. Um, Allie, did you guys, did you write that refrain? You, Eric did? That was really good. That was really good. Um, I grew up in a church singing like the old hymns. And, and so sometimes when Allie and Eric put a fresh like taste to them, it just, it takes me back to a place. And the lyrics of that are so good and so aligned with exactly what Paul is going to be inviting us into um, this morning. When I was uh, 14 years old, uh, my family and I made the long trip from Dayton, Ohio, down to Merritt Island, Florida. Um, I had signed up to be a part of a mission trip, um, but it wasn't like your typical like short-term mission trip. This was like a, a, a 12-week long, um, entire summer mission trip, and I didn't know anybody on my team. I'd never met another one of the leaders. I had never met another one of the students. We went down to Merritt Island, Florida, where there was two weeks of training that they called boot camp um, before we departed for our, our trip experience in Bermuda. And while I was in Bermuda, I lived in, on this tiny little island and we stayed in tents on the island. And I would, um, I would catch lizards to keep in my tent because they would eat the cockroaches. Um, because, and the cockroaches bit. And so I'd rather have lizards than, than biting cockroaches. Like that was kind of like, a, well, if you're gonna, uh, you know, go with the lizard thing. And, and we, we roughed it. We had cold showers, like water was uh, a bit scarce there. They would have these collection barrels. And so you would just turn the shower on quickly, get wet, soap up, and then, and then rinse yourself off. And, and that was it. It was cold and it was fast. We did our laundry. I did my laundry in a bucket with a hose all summer long, like this is how I lived. And this is how everybody around me lived. Um, and then it came time for me to, to return home. It was the end of the summer, I was heading back. And again, because um, we all came from different places from around the world. Now, like thinking back on this experience, I'm, I kind of question the parenting decision that went on here. Like, <laughs> um, but, but when I was heading home, I, I got on a flight and didn't know anybody, and I arrived in the Indianapolis airport. My parents were there, and my grandparents, and, and my siblings, and, and I could see, like, they were excited to see me. This was like back in the day when, when you arrived at the airport, they, people could go to the gate to greet you. And so they're all there, and they're excited to see me, and, and yet then I saw like a secondary response on their faces, like when they laid eyes on me. Kind of like a, like, oh, like sort of sense. And then as I got closer to him, I went in to hug him. It was kind of like, oh, like sort of. And all of a sudden I began to realize that, that I had been living in rough conditions with very limited access for 12 weeks with a group of people who also were living like I was living for those 12 weeks. And in the course of transitioning from that reality to a new reality, um, that, that I hadn't made that transition physically. Like I, I, I kind of looked like a, a homeless guy and, and smelled like I hadn't showered in 12 weeks, right? And, and Paul today, we've been working our way through this book on Colossians. And Paul has been giving us this, this incredibly soaring, incredibly high view uh, and description of, of who Jesus is. And in fact, that's what Allie and Eric recited at the beginning of our worship service this morning, those verses from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 17. We've been working on memorizing this together as a church because understanding who Jesus is impacts the way that we live our lives. And, and in fact, when Paul's talking about this, he's going to talk about the implications of Jesus in terms of how do we, how do we let go of the old self this previous reality, and how do we put on what he talks about as a new self, 
a self that has been received from Jesus himself. So before we, we dive into that, let's remind ourselves of kind of where we've been. Paul at the outset, he, he makes this case for, this argument for the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus. And he says it's all, it's all evidenced by the resurrection. That's, that's sort of where he grounds his argument. He's the firstborn from among the dead, he says. And so now he's, he's applied this truth about Jesus and he's spoken into this group of people who are seeking to follow Jesus in, in this environment where there, there's all kinds of external pressures to take their faith in Jesus and, and sort of add to it. So it's whether it's Jesus and kind of what in Colossians chapter two, Paul refers to as these elemental spiritual forces, this, this paganism that they had grown on and known and worshiped in probably a good portion of their life. So some people are saying, well, it's Jesus. Yeah, but let's, let's maintain some of this other stuff. Or there's people that grew up in the, in the Jewish tradition and faith and they're saying, well, it's Jesus, but Let's make sure we keep adhering to the Old Testament law, which Paul's point is like all of that, all of that Old Testament law was pointing us to Jesus. It was meant to direct us. So Paul speaks into these pressures and he says, it's not Jesus plus. It, it, Jesus doesn't need anything added to him. It's not Jesus plus this, the, the Jesus among other gods. It's not Jesus plus adherence to the Old Testament law, it's just Jesus. It's only Jesus. He's all that we need, he's totally, he doesn't lack anything. And so now Paul wants us to live out our lives as, as followers of Jesus and the power of, of what we just sing about, the power of what he refers to or talks about as this resurrected life. See, for Paul, under understanding and recognizing the truth of who Jesus is has implications. For Paul, this, this matters. And so for them, as they're seeking to live out their faith in this environment where there's all these external pressures, he, he's directing them back to Jesus. And he's like, let's talk about what this life looks like. And for you and I, he, he does the same as we seek to do the same. Let's turn to Colossians chapter three. Colossians chapter 3, we're going to begin in verse 1. We're going to kind of work our way through the first 17 verses of, of Colossians 3 here. Paul writes this, he says, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So Paul, Paul begins this section of the letter, and he's talking about, he shows us how identifying with Jesus leads us to this, this new way of living. And he begins so by describing what I'm going to call a new reality. Paul, Paul begins with defining this new Reality and notice kind of the logic that that Paul's using here. Like, does anybody can anybody remember sophomore year geometry class? Anybody? Me neither. You're literally in your sophomore year geometry <laughs> class. That's a, and um, I was thinking about this this week as I was reading this because Paul's logic here is is something of like an if then statement. You remember this from geometry, right? Like, here's an example of an if-then statement. He's saying, if B is between A and C, then AB plus BC equals AC, right? Is that right? I don't know, I just Googled that, so it's. <laughs> but, but Paul's saying, if we assert this to be true, if what we've said, if what we've taught about Jesus, if, if we affirm this, then there are implications to that in our, in our everyday, ordinary lives. Like, this isn't just, theory. It, it, it matters. It affects the way that we live. So you seeing everything I've been telling you up to this point in this letter about his supremacy, about his sufficiency, he's saying it matters. And, and, and it matters how we live. And Paul paces these instructions to the followers of Jesus and the conviction and the belief that, that Jesus is who he says he is and that he's done what, what we believe he's done. And he's saying it's this, this understanding that creates a new reality in our lives. 
So then Paul builds on this. He, he says this, the implications of this new reality is, is seen and felt in a couple of ways. He gives us some responses or some commands to this. Look at these same verses now. And in red, I just use these things, he's saying, do this as a result. Since this reality, this experience in Christ, then set your hearts on things above and, and set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. But all of this, even these instructions, right, it's grounded in a reminder of the, this new reality of this resurrected life. Look again at these verses but now highlighting these, he's saying, this is what you've been. Like at verse three, right? You died, Paul writes. And then in verse one, he started off by defining and understanding that you've been raised with Christ. And then again in verse three, he, he says, not only have you been raised with Christ, but you are now hidden with Christ. In verse four, he says, your life is, is in Christ. He is your life. See, let's, let's take a moment to just think about this, this resurrected life that Paul's talking about. I don't know if you've ever had somebody just, maybe you had a conversation at work or a neighbor or something. Help me understand, what does it really mean to be a Christian? Um, may, maybe like a, a friend or somebody's asked you that before. Maybe you've asked that before. I know that I have. Maybe you could be here asking that right now, and Paul is giving us this really succinct and yet um, powerful understanding of what transpires when we place our faith in Jesus. Because he's saying this, this old self, this, this pre-Jesus version of Sterling, he's saying it's not, it's not merely inhibited, it's not just limited or, or wounded or, or held back, he's saying it's dead. This prior version of me apart from Christ is dead. And the same is true for you. And not only is it dead, but he says that there is in fact a new Sterling, what he says elsewhere, he calls a new creation that's been risen with Christ and then is also hidden in Christ, which I, I love the, the terminology there because the way Paul like pictures this is almost sort of like absorbed inside of. Right? So there's this sense of protection. You're, you're free from accusation. You are in Christ. It's his character and his quality. That's, that defines, that describes this new life that we have in him. So, so Paul reminds us that when Jesus broke the power of sin by raising from the dead, that, that when I put my faith in Jesus, that same accomplishment and that same victory have been attributed to me. Right? It's been applied to me, so guilt and shame and spiritual defeat. He's saying they, they have no claim on you. They have no right o over you. They have no accusation against you because that you is dead. It no longer exists. And there is a new version of you that's been risen with Christ and is hidden in Christ. When Paul describes his own own experience of this. This is in, in his letter to um, the Galatians. He says it this way. He says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Right? This, is, this is what we, we picture and celebrate when we share in baptisms together. Here, when, when we baptize people at, at Mill Creek, and um, may, maybe you don't know this, but when they're going into the water, what I'm saying over them is buried with Christ in baptism. This old you is, is dead. And as they're coming out of the water, I say risen in new life with him. This is, this is what we're celebrating, that reality. We're identifying that in our lives. And yet, there's a danger that we experience where we live out of alignment with that. Uh, on that same mission trip that I was um, on in Bermuda as a 14-year-old, this was the summer between my, my freshman, no, my, my eighth grade and my freshman year. And um, I, we would spend the weekend, we would take a boat from the island that we lived on and we would stay in churches over the weekend and do ministry and, and go out and do like evangelism and we did uh, puppet shows on the street. Turns out it does not draw a huge crowd, um, <laughs> by the way. And, and, um, 
and we would sleep on the concrete floors of, of these churches. And, and one night, apparently, I didn't get um, a great night of sleep. And so that Sunday morning, we're in the service. And, um, and as the pastor is, is preaching, I started to doze off. Um, and do not judge me, people, because I've seen some of you do the same thing, right? And, and have you ever been kind of like one of those in-between states? Like where you're, you're sort of half asleep and you're half awake. And I started to, I, I started to dream in, in this state. And I, I was dreaming about basketball. Um, it's apparently, I don't know, what I was thinking about at the time. And, and like, I don't know if you've had these moments when you're kind of in that in-between place where your body will physically react to what you're dreaming about. So this is how I woke up in the middle of the church service. In my dream, somebody was passing a basketball to me. And then I physically like reached out to grab the basketball and then like woke myself up. I look around like everybody is staring at me. I just pretend to have like a, a work of the Holy Spirit going on like in the, <laughs> in the middle of the service. And see, because my, my body, my mind were not in alignment with my reality. I, I was living out of alignment. And so I acted in a way that didn't fit with what was going on in the space around me. This is, this is what Paul is addressing here. Paul reaffirms that when we are in Christ, there is a new status in Jesus. If he is who we say he is, and if he has accomplished, if he's done what we say he's done, if we are in fact risen with him, then there is a new status, a new position. He says, don't forget it because it's your new reality. This is real for you. In light of that, then he reminds us, what do we do with this? We, we set our hearts on things above. We, we, we set our minds there, he says. He's saying you reorient your life in the direction and purpose of, of his life and his kingdom and what he calls us to, what he's about. But again, this, you can hear this and we, we, we listen to this. And yet the reality is, if you're anything like me, that there are times in your life where this does not feel like your experience. Like what, what, how I would define my experience is not, doesn't feel like new life. In fact, it looks sometimes an awful lot like a pre-Jesus version of Sterling. And why is that? Why, why if, if, if the old is dead and the new has come, why do I still struggle? And Paul is, is going to speak into this as well, and he does so by talking about a new identity a new identity back in, in Colossians chapter three, picking it up now in verse five. So you remember Paul in verse three has talked about for, for you died and now in verse five he begins by saying, put to death therefore whatever belongs to the earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which he just says that's just, that's idolatry. He says, because of these things, the wrath of God is, is coming. So he's saying, God is not going to stand by and, and idly watch just brokenness play out, right? He's, he is going to address these issues. And Paul goes on, he says, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, Slander, filthy language from your lips. So Paul begins to describe this, this, how things were before Jesus made us new. Imagine for a moment that, that um, I had planned like a really nice date night with my wife. They were going to maybe go down into the city, go out someplace really nice for dinner and see a show or, or a concert or or something like that. And then imagine as I'm preparing for this date that I still have in my closet those clothes that I had come home from and been at the airport and they had stayed in my closet unlaundered for the last 30 years. And then I went and, and put those on to go out in on my date, right? That's just disgusting, Sherry. <laughs> Sherry's getting sick over there. Like the, like you would look at that and you would say, that's, that's crazy, that doesn't fit, that's, that's inappropriate, it's, it's, it's revolting because that is, that is a, a residual thing from a reality that no longer exists. It, does, it doesn't fit. And it's, it's the markers of an identity that you once carried. See, Paul pictures this new identity that he 
instructs us to, to put on, he talks about in terms of what we wear, what, what we clothe ourselves with. And so Paul begins to describe this exchange. He talks about how we should first put to death these things that belong to this old pre-Jesus version of us. Things like sexual immorality and greed and evil desires and lust and impurity. And he says, rid ourselves of, of things like anger and rage, of, of malice and slander and, 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 and the way we talk that doesn't reflect who Jesus is. He said, those things are hallmarks of a previous version of you. And he says, that life is now dead. So don't wear them. This is, this is Paul's instruction. You were once identified by these actions. And Paul says it makes perfect sense because your hearts and your minds and that, and that part of your story, your hearts and your minds were focused on earthly things, but that's an old reality and those are an old identity. He says you used to walk in these ways in the life that you once lived. I, I, I love what Paul does here. Because he, he is able to describe this in a way that, for me anyways, is both convicting but, but, but inspiring. Like, it, 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 you hear sort of like his pastoral heart describing what he wants for these people as they seek to follow Jesus. Um, he'll, he'll go on. We'll look at this in just a second. But he, he says, like, you're not a liar. Like, that, that was an old identity. That, that is an old reality for you. And when you, when you placed your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, that, that version of you was crucified on the cross. So, so why do you lie, Paul says? He's saying that is essentially wearing the old clothes of a previous identity. I don't know if, if you've had those moments in life when you've sought to sort of achieve a certain image Right? A lot of times we go through this in like middle school and high school. Some of you guys will relate. There's a certain crowd that you're trying to fit into. And so you've got to dress and act and be a certain way. And if you've ever tried to do that, you know how exhausting it could be. But that's not, that's not just a, an adolescent issue. Um, we, we do this as adults as well. In fact, I, um, I regularly meet with Pastor Brian. And one of his roles in my life is he continues to be sort of a mentor and shepherd in terms of of preaching and, and, and how do we deliver this in, in a way. And, and one of the things that he'll often challenge me on is, is moments when he can tell that I'm trying to be somebody else. Like, like, uh, like if I've heard a, a pastor or a preacher and I, I'm trying to sort of like kind of mimic the way they would deliver something or do something in a, in a certain tone. And, and, and he um, inevitably can recognize it and will say, hey, that, that just, it doesn't sound like you. Like, it was good, the content was right, but it just, it didn't, it sounded like somebody else was talking. It's like, you, you gotta make it you. And, and he's absolutely right. Like, I recognize that I do that, and there's something about it that always feels off to us. Why is that? Because it's not us. Because it's out of alignment with our identity. It's not you. See, this is, this is Paul's point to the Christians. These things that he describes about that need to be put to death, that we need to rid ourselves of, he's saying, this isn't you anymore. So he picks this up in verse 9 there. He says, do not lie to each other, since you've taken off the old self with its practices, and you've put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. And I, I love verse 11, because he says, there is, there, here there is no Gentile or Jew, Circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, Christ is all and is in all. So he, he pictures this sort of this level ground at the foot of the cross where there is, there's no hierarchy, there's no competing. He's saying there is just people who've experienced grace and have been transformed. But that is the primary identifier in our lives. And then he goes on in verse 12, therefore is God's chosen people holy and dearly loved. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, Paul writes, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. 
right? You, see, you hear the if then in this. He says, therefore, put, put on the character of Christ. Because you are hidden with Christ. If Christ is supreme and Christ is sufficient, then, then you and I, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, we, we clothe ourselves with compassion and gentleness and humility and, and patience. And, and he says, clothe yourselves with, with love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Our response to this, to live in the new self, is to clothe ourselves in the character of Christ. Now, before I, I, I move on here, I want to I want to just briefly take a moment to think about what is what is on a, on a practical level. What does it mean to to take off and and the old self and put on the new self? What does this look like, and what is our part in that? As it relates to taking off the old self, there's there's a couple things that come to mind. First, I think it's important to identify. It's important to recognize when there is something in my life that is reminiscent of a previous pre-Jesus version of me, I need to be able to acknowledge it for what it is and say that that is out of alignment with my new reality and my new identity. I'm wearing the clothes of a previous version of me. I just, I just need to be able to call it out for what it is. And, and if we struggle to do that sometimes, if, if you're in an environment where there's people that love you, and, and are able to help you see those things, um, that can be useful too. But it, it's not enough to merely identify. The second thing that I think is critical is I also have to confess it. Meaning that once I see it, I have to be able to take it to, to Jesus and be able to say, I recognize that I am, I am living in a pattern that is reflective of, of a pre encounter with Jesus version of me and it's, it doesn't belong here. This is, this is old clothes. I have put something on that, that no, I should no longer wear and I need to bring this to you and I'll, I'll tell you this real quickly. It is a wonderful thing that we have the freedom and the ability to be able to take those things to a loving God and, and seek forgiveness from him and I encourage you to do that. We're instructed to do that. It is also an amazing thing to be able to do that in the context of community. When you have people in your life that you can also say, hey guys, I've, I've acknowledged and I recognize that I'm, I'm, I have an action or an attitude that is, does not reflect my life in Christ and, and I need to bring it out into the open so light can be on it and I, I, I need you guys to journey with me. In this because, and the reason I tell you this is there's something incredibly powerful about having brothers and sisters in Jesus be able to receive that from you and then to be able to speak grace over that. And so you know what, Sterling, like, Jesus died to take care of that. They're, that's covered by his grace. Like, sometimes I audibly need to hear grace spoken over my sin. And when you can build the kind of relationships where that can happen in the, in the body of Christ, like, that is... It's an incredibly powerful thing, and it's a, it's a gift. None of us like it. I, I never like to sit down with somebody and say, hey, I need, I need to tell you about what's really going on. Um, but it's also one of the best gifts I've ever received in my entire life. And then thirdly, as it relates to taking it off, it, it means turning and walking the opposite direction. It's, it's the definition of repent, <laughs> right? This is where the act of the will comes in. I identify that my, my identity is no longer that of a liar, and so I'm going to choose to walk towards truth and, and away from deceit. I, I, I choose to act and, and align my life in a way that represents the, the character of Christ, which brings us then to, well, what does it look like then to, to put this on? Does this mean that we just work harder at being more compassionate, at being gentler and kinder and, and, and more humble? Does it, is it just our effort, we sort of grit our teeth and say, I'm going to do, I'm going to do better? See, I think the thing that we have to remember here is that th this being worked out in us is, is the job of the Holy Spirit. Like, this is the work that he is actively doing. As if you are a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. He is working right now to create in you the character of Christ. And so for us, for you and I, it's not merely a matter of like, gritting our teeth and working harder and putting more muscle into doing these things. It's recognizing and a knowledge, this is the Holy Spirit's work in me, and so how can I partner with him in his work? 
How, how can I join him in that effort? In Philippians chapter two, Paul says this. He says, continue to work out your salvation with, with fear and trembling so that when you read that, you're just sort of like, okay, well, I just got to work harder. I got to put more effort in. I got to, but then he goes on. He says, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purposes. This is God's work in you. Just a simple prayer in our hearts to be able to say, okay, Holy Spirit, I recognize that you want to produce these things into me. When, when there is opportunity today, can I join you in your work? And begin to view your life that way. The last thing then what we see here is, is Paul's talked about a new reality. He's talked about a new identity and he gives us a new focus. He gives us a new focus back in, in Colossians chapter three, verse 15. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful and let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs uh, from, from the spirit singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether it word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord, Paul writes, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So there's, there's two things that, that Paul emphasizes here that he identifies as vital in terms of living in this new reality and living in this new identity. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, which, which he's already defined earlier in Colossians chapter one. I'm not going to go there for the sake of time, but he talks about how we've been, the, that Christ made peace through the blood shed on the cross. So essentially he's saying, how do, how do we do this? What does this look like? One, you live in the awareness that you have been made right with God. You, you live with, with a peace that is only possible after Jesus has made us right with God. When, when you have placed your faith in Jesus, your standing with God is in perfect relationship with him. Doesn't mean that we are perfect, doesn't mean that we do things perfect, but we are surrounded by Jesus that's been restored, that's been renewed. He's good with you. Like live in that, like I, I doubt that sometimes. I struggle with that, I forget that at times. Paul says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. He says that also affects how we relate to each other. And then secondly, he says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. He's saying, church, men and women, followers of Jesus, as you seek to, to live this out, let the message of the gospel and of the kingdom of Christ be central to everything that you do and to all that, that you are. He's saying Jesus should take up permanent residence among us and he should be the center of our worship and the focus of our lives. As the author of, of Hebrews says, he says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the, the pioneer and the perfecter of your faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of God. Right? And notice that all of this, every instruction that Paul gives us, it's, it's written into the context of community. It's, it's all written in a, you, you do this together. In fact, when I, when I arrived at the Indianapolis airport and the, wearing the clothes and the, the self of a previous reality, I was greeted by a family that loved me, that, that surrounded me despite the offensiveness that, that I carried in that moment and, and hugged me and they, they helped me make the transition from a previous reality to a new reality. They, they eventually got me in new clothes, right? And a shower and a haircut and several other hygiene-based things, right? See, this is, this is what the, the vision of the church that Paul is giving us for each other is that we live in community together, constantly pointing us, each other, to Jesus so that you and I understand and live that we let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts and that the message of Christ dwells richly among us. This is what we're called to be here in this place for each other so that the world will look at us and they're going to see him. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity just to, um, to be reminded that what you accomplished based on who you are has huge implications for the way that we live. 
And so because we believe that about you, let us live out this, this reality and this identity that reflects you. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.